in America, we're very, very sick. Americans ate meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Corporations have been pushing the idea of plant-based diets because it's far more profitable. If you're only eating Doritos and cereal, you really don't notice the consequences of monetary inflation and money printing. But if you're eating animal-based products like eggs, milk, steak, you really realize this and you feel it. Red meat is becoming increasingly a food of the upper classes. The obesity rates are through the roof. The people are only partially to blame. We've been lied to and we've been lied to for political reasons. The most striking thing I've noticed about carnivore is that my mind is more efficient. The reason that they began getting into the business of food and telling us what to eat is almost exclusively due to the fact that they're trying very hard to maintain power. The whole milk I substituted out for low fat milk, but nobody likes low fat milk. So what did they do? They shoved it full of strawberry sugaring and chocolate flavored sugaring. We've shifted from whole milk to our kids drinking strawberry flavored low fat milk or chocolate flavored low fat milk that has as much sugar as soda. The carnivore diet more or less is, is the base diet. That's what people have been eating for thousands of years. They're lying to us about our food. That's insane. And they did knowingly. They know that Fruit Loops are not healthier than eggs. They know that, yet they're telling us that. We often discuss on, on this channel how Bitcoin can change things, how Bitcoin can influence uh, certain uh, types of our lives outside of money. I mean, money is kind of obvious. Uh, and I think food is a really interesting one. Uh, Siphonin mentioned it a little bit in, in his book. Now he wrote, you wrote a book uh, and I think he's co-author or he wrote something with it. Uh, uh, I think it's with Siphonin and Musa saw uh, the book. Um, maybe let's talk about first, like how did you come to the book idea? How did this all start and then why why our food is wrong i'm an investigative reporter i worked for a little over a decade for the new york daily news which at the time when i was there was the fifth biggest paper in america my job was to parachute into breaking news stories so i covered between 2008 and 2000, you know, uh, 14, probably every one of the big national stories you've heard of. So I've always been very curious and skeptical of government. When COVID hit, it took it to a new level for me. And I began going down rabbit holes of economics, which led me to Safedina Dina Moose. I read the Bitcoin Standard, which I found fascinating, but it was his book, The Fiat Standard, which really triggered some changes in perspective on my end. In particular, chapter eight of the fiat standard was about how our food system was corrupted. On its face, I thought the allegation a moose made, which was that our food has been hijacked by this conspiracy through these religious groups, corporate influence, and then the government trying to obscure the consequences of monetary inflation, I thought it was absurd. And I began as an investigative reporter, just sort of fact checking this chapter. And what I realized was that not only was Saifedean correct, but if anything, he had understated the case. And I looked at this as quite possibly the most consequential cover up of the last 50 years. I mean, look, in America, we're very, very sick. So I approached Safedine and I wanted to dive in on this. I, I published with Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, Scholastic, all the major publishers. I knew none of them based on this topic would be willing to give this book a chance. I wanted to publish this on our own. Safedine agreed. He has a fantastic network. He started his own publishing house. I became his first author. And on September 23rd of last year, we released Fiat Food. Really cool. Uh, so now, like, let's let's just dive into the most obvious question. Why is something wrong with our food? What you find happening is in the early 1900s, leading up to 1970, Americans ate meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, they sticked primarily to the food that their ancestors have eaten for thousands of years before that meat. But on August 15th, 1971, something changes. Previous to August 15th, 1971, in 1970, Americans on, on average ate about 155 pounds of meat a year, red meat. 
This started shifting dramatically after 1971. And the significance of this date is Richard Nixon on August 15th decoupled from the gold standard. So previous to August 15th, 1971, foreign banks could redeem their dollars into into the uh, United States Treasury for gold. American citizens couldn't, but foreign banks could. And this provided a powerful restraint on spending. But when Nixon decoupled from gold, what we realize and what we see through, I did over 200 freedom of information requests, is that the government begins shifting the nation's food supply, and they do this intentionally. And one thing that really struck me was that government seemed very aware that endless war and corruption, the American voter and in general voters around the world seem to tolerate. But when food prices go too high, there's riots and social upheaval. I can point to uh, Sri Lanka in 2022, where the soaring costs of meat and eggs and milk large were, were largely responsible for 200, 300,000 people um, going to the palace and, and the leaders had to flee the country. According to the American University, there are over 12,500 food and energy related riots in Europe in 2022 alone. So they're very sensitive. The governments are very sensitive about the correlation between the rising cost of food and political instability. So what you see after we decoupled from gold is basically a 55 year psyop to convince us that the food we've eaten as a species for thousands of years is no longer appropriate for our diet. And instead we should be eating cheaper mass produced grains which if you're only eat, if you're only eating doritos and cereal you really don't notice the consequences of monetary inflation and money printing but if you're eating animal based products like eggs milk steak you really realize this and you feel it i mean in america today red meat is becoming increasingly a food of the upper classes and cost prohibitive for the lower and middle classes and This isn't without very dire consequences. If you walk into any Walmart in America and just look in line, you'll see the obesity rates are through the roof. And the people are only partially to blame. We've been lied to. And we've been lied to for political reasons. Um, And and Fiat Food, my book, walks step by step through the process of not only how that happened, but the motive behind it. Very interesting. So, so. The food chain is the origin of the problem, basically, and the 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 approach of keeping the cost of food down, so people don't realize that inflation is actually way worse than than it is. Did, did I understand the problem correct? Yeah, and also to understand the political climate of the 1970s, there was a concern that we were. It wasn't global warming back then. That's not what people were freaking out about. People were upset about overpopulation. They were concerned in particular that there was going to be too many people and not enough food and that meat was resource intensive so that we also needed to switch to grain. So it was a confluence of different events that led to this. And also corporations have been pushing the idea of plant-based diets because it's far more profitable to have the nation eating grains like 14th century peasants as opposed to meat because you can basically print corn like the same way you can print fiat dollars just you could do it at scale and just um you know i have four daughters and if i buy five boxes of cereal it's pretty cheap i could feed my whole family and everybody will be full but the problem is the nutrients required for humans to thrive has gone exceedingly high. So if people really understood and wanted to eat real food, it, they would take it and, and they saw what was happening, they would take it out on their political leaders. And right now, the, we're sort of in this, in America, we're in this situation where we're not, where the true consequences of inflation have been hidden from us.
but you see it in the in the human body of the the average american so so is uh the plant based and vegan diets uh um a cause of fear than the monetary policy uh or is it something that would have came up anyways um there would always there's always been well not always i assume there would be people who ate still ate plants but a lot of the nutrition science that people have relied on that claims to be science and advocate advocate the eating of plants it's not really science it's more like uh marketing and it mostly comes from one university in california called wobelinda university which gets since 1971 when fiat could just print out dollars has gotten hundreds of millions of dollars in government grants and it's run by i know this is this is, i'm going a lot of places here but just bear with me it's very complicated the university is run by the seventh day adventist church it's not a conspiracy it's just on their website and they're a group that believes and they believe honestly that um eating meat is a sin and that it makes your body impure and they've been heavily influential in the field of nutrition and they're the ones who are generating these studies which aren't actual studies they just sort of validate the religious conviction so not to get too far into the weeds on science but there's really two main kinds of studies there's observational studies and these observational studies cannot establish causal relations essentially i can do a study that says i pulled 100 people who had cancer and 97 of them have had milk at some point so based on that i can say milk linked to cancer and that's a headline that comes out they're not double blind controlled studies which can establish causal relationships so it's it, it's phony science and i spoke to a lot of scientists who sort of explain that these sort of studies aren't done for other scientists they're done to generate headlines to guide public perception and that's exactly what we've seen happen with our food supply there's a lot of people who think eating like a peasant from the 1400s is noble and virtuous whereas eating meat is somehow sinful or bad for our health when the exact opposite is true it's really interesting for me like i myself uh, unfortunately did not dive too deep into in the food and nutrition uh, uh there is like so many opinions out there i think it's like really hard to dive deep in this this food topic because it's also so weirdly enough such an emotional topic for so many people uh when you talk like oh i'm only eating meat i'm only eating plant-based like people have such an uh emotional response even to to food so like oh you're eating this then you're saying that my diet is wrong um it's really interesting for me um i just did not do a, a proper research on that um what i noticed that that in the bitcoin community I think they are mostly um an animal uh, based uh, diet eaters but there are a, a growing number on plant based diet eaters also um what i found fascinating is also they uh, arguing with each other and uh, the <laughs> the lovingness even uh, when they argue with each other there's some things that both have in common like they both argue for fresh food not processed food for like uh high quality food and not like you, you can do also like all the things with animal based um, with, with plant based food um it is would you say is uh steak and all the memes that we see on on twitter is that the the sound money uh bitcoin food or is uh it's more like fresh food uh, look after for for new nutrients like what what is bitcoin or sound money food uh for you well the relation i would say is that a hard currency like bitcoin is our natural state of existence it's in line with reality whereas there isn't some third party with a printing press that can just take away i mean In America the idea that you own your dollar bill is really just a slogan. You don't own a dollar bill because there's a third party that can print an unlimited supply and you have no say over that. So they actually are the ones in control of your labor. It's it's not the individual. That's not the natural state of human existence. We we um for most of our time on earth we've traded 
goods for other goods. There hasn't been a third party siphoning things off. I mean, there were in Roman times a little bit, you see it, but generally it reverts back to gold or silver. Gold was better. I think Bitcoin's an evolution of that. But also in the same way, I think um, I plan, there's no historical precedent to say that a society can just eat plants and be healthy. I think plants are amazing. I think they're wonderful medicines. Um, but if you look at the Maasai tribe in Africa, who have been studied a lot and they only eat meat, they only drink raw milk and, and blood and sometimes honey, but, or the Inuit in Alaska, these are groups of people that exist on a strictly animal-based diet, almost exclusively, and they don't have any of the health problems that we have in modern America. And I don't think that's a coincidence. You can't really point to any group of people who've subsisted on plants for any amount of time and been able to continue and prosper. I don't think that's not to say that um, plants have no place. I mean, I, I'm not, I know people, I know what you're saying. People get oddly religious about this. Um, and it's, it's kind of frustrating to sometimes have these discussions. I mean, I think if you can eliminate sugar into processed foods, you're way ahead of the game already, even if, but I've tried, I've tried personally, I've tried plant-based a few years ago. I didn't, I didn't know. And at first I felt great. And it was because I cut out the sugar and the processed foods. So I'm only eating these fresh foods, but in time, my energy went, um, I am pretty strictly carnivore now. I drink a lot of raw milk to keep myself out of ketosis and to keep my weight up. And I'm very athletic. I play, you know, I'm in a basketball league and I run every morning. But the most striking thing I've noticed about carnivore is that my mind is more efficient. I can remember more and I don't experience the ups and downs from the plants that I used to have from, from significant amounts of carbohydrates. Are you ca are eating carnivore in only meat or also with some vegetables like raw milk and only meat? Um, cheese, eggs, meat. I, I stay away from vegetables. I mean, I don't think vegetables are, are that bad if you can get them without being... In America, all of our vegetables are genetically altered and they're sprayed with extremely toxic chemicals. So every time I eat a vegetable, I feel like I'm playing Russian roulette a little bit. And the truth is, I just don't feel as good. So, you know, we can debate all you want and everybody could have these debates and I appreciate these debates, but my body is the ultimate arbiter for what I put in myself. And when I, if I were to go eat, you know, some Brussels sprouts right now, I wouldn't feel great afterwards. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, I think it's really hard to say for me because I just did not do the, the deep research on that. I definitely have to do that. Uh, but what I 100% agree uh, with everyone saying like fresh food and be aware where you buy it. For, like, for example, in Austria, you have a lot of farmers where you can directly buy from a farmer, no matter if it's uh, plants or raw milk or Uh, meat you actually see like you, you can see where the animals are they are they are doing it on farm there's nothing in between uh you can talk with the guy who does everything so i, I like that a lot where you can directly get the meat from from the farmer uh, and get your milk and and all the things like my my uncle has a farm and i got most of my milk when i came up uh only from from there like we had always fresh raw milk directly from from the cow uh, basically like, like two days after it came from the cow one day sometimes the same day so that was uh, something that i noticed uh was really good for for my upbringing um but yeah the the food topic is is really imp interesting maybe I, maybe i have to uh, at some point I have to uh, uh make a, a vegan versus uh, animal based carnivore uh debate with with two bitcoiners it would be interesting to see but the the bigger question that i have is does inflation has a direct impact on our health Yeah, it does. It it's it, in the sense that inflation makes the nutrients that we need to thrive cost prohibitive, and the entire propaganda campaign to convince us to eat plants and to stray from the diet humans have had for generations 
all stems from the fact that the government's trying to hide the consequences of monetary inflation. Since 1971, when Nixon decoupled and we began printing all these dollars, and you see these changes and you see these government policies in very specific ways manifest into our food supply. For instance, um, Nixon appointed as agriculture secretary a man named Earl Butts, who then began pushing millions of fiat dollars to subsidize the industries of corn, soy, and sugar. As a result, especially corn, in America, corn isn't everything we eat. Um, you can't drink Coke without having corn syrup in it. You're putting corn on your pancakes. And soy and sugar are not far behind on that list. But it's it's impossible to look at the modern food supply. And that doesn't even include the propaganda money going towards these campaigns disguised as science to convince people to eat. Or for instance, January of 2023, um, the Tufts Food Compass came out, which is funded largely by government and corporate interests. And these are the experts of the world of nutrition. They've spent their whole lives dedicated to nutrition. What do they conclude? They conclude that Fruit Loops and Cinnamon Toast Crunch Bars are healthier for people than meat and eggs. I mean, that's obviously not true. That's dumb. Of course it's not true. But, you know, this, these recommendations by experts become law in America. And what you see as a result, for instance, of the 1992 food pyramid in America, where people were recommended to eat between 8 to 11 servings of grains a day, that becomes law in our public school system. So almost every child in America throughout all of grade school is eating tons of grains and tons of sugar. And by the time they come out of school, they're metabolically compromised. I maintain that if Nixon never would have decoupled and there would no, there'd be no reason to hide the consequences of monetary inflation because there wouldn't be monetary inflation. It would be very slow. There'd be, the government would have no business in, in the industry of food. The reason that they began getting into the business of food and telling us what to eat is largely due to the fact that they're almost exclusively due to the fact that they're trying very hard to maintain power. And like I stated before, if people were eating the diets essential to health, they would be up in arms right now over the cost. They wouldn't be able to afford it. They would not be, most Americans cannot afford to eat red meat, drink raw milk, drink the food that our great, great, great grandparents ate. It's just not an option. How do play, how do does uh, government subsidies play in, in, into this? Is uh, governments with uh, subsidizing uh, different kinds of food um, also like uh, incentivizing this fiat food? Yeah, of course. That's all these government studies, all these studies that come out almost exclusively are from government or corporate interests. It's not science. They're observational studies. And like the Tufts Food Compass, which came out in 2023, or the dietary guidelines, which came out, the, the pyramid, which came out in 1992, it's on its face, it's absurd. I mean, The Tufts Food Compass, which came out in 2023, it was a marketing campaign because that same month, that same month, Robin, um, 20 or I think, yeah, 60 Minutes, one of the most uh, prestigious news programs in America, had a segment on um, Wagovi, the weight loss drug. And two, the two experts interviewed had both been paid by Novo Nordisk, the parent company. And they were proposing this idea, which is becoming mainstream now, that obesity is not the result of lifestyle choices, but it's a brain disease, a genetic brain disease. And that Wagovi and these weight loss shots are really the only way to fix this. Now, I consider these people, the doctor in particular, Dr. Fatima Stanford is the one who was interviewed, who was a paid consultant for Novo Nordisk while promoting in a news show this drug. I consider her evil in the sense that what she's doing is undermining something so essential to being human, which is our ability 
to control the outcomes of the things most fundamental to our own existence, which is our health, right? Like she's saying, no, no, trust the white coats, trust the doctors, outsource your judgment. The lucky charms are fine. It's not because you're eating three cheesecakes every morning and Doritos. It's, it's not your fault. And that's the way America's shifting right now. And I would argue heavily that it's this tide that's pushing in this direction. And it's, I consider it evil because it's leading to the direct death and sickness of most, most Americans. Over 50% of American children right now are pre-diabetic by some measures. And we're not, like, we're not seeing the connection. I mean, the increase in the amount of sugar we've eaten since 1970, because for instance, as one example for why sugar's exploded, public schools used to be able to drink whole milk. That used to be served at every public school in America, whole milk. And when the 1992 food pyramid came out, saturated fat was billed as evil. So the raw milk got, I mean, the, the whole milk got substituted out for low fat milk. But nobody likes low-fat milk. It tastes terrible. It tastes like water. It's disgusting. So what did they do in America? They shoved it full of strawberry sugaring and chocolate-flavored sugaring. So now in the public schools, instead of we've shifted from whole milk to our kids drinking strawberry-flavored low-fat milk or chocolate-flavored low-fat milk that has as much sugar as soda, while at the same time, the soda companies are funding exclusive contracts with individual schools in our country to keep soda available in the public schools. So by the time these kids come out of school, they're metabolically compromised. And it's not an accident. My argument is it's intentional, not to the extent that our government wants us to make us sick. They don't. Our government isn't intentionally trying to make people sick. I don't believe that. Um, but what I do believe is that they've created an incentive process to obscure the consequences of monetary inflation that has led directly to that result. I also think that's a systematic uh, problem, not like someone evil wants to destroy the planet <laughs> and wants to make everyone sick. Um, what what role does uh, do big corporations uh, you uh, play in this, as you talked before, uh, that plant-based is more profitable? Uh, what, what role does this play? Yeah, it's interesting. In my book, Fiat Food, I track through how corporations have had a pretty large role in this. And you can go back to before we went off the gold standard. You could go back to the 40s and the 50s when corporations first started. Um, actually, the, the first example I'll use goes even before that. There was a Procter and Gamble made lots of candles with cottonseed oil. And they had this extra cottonseed oil after we transitioned to light bulbs. They didn't know what to do with it. So they made margarine. And, you know, they tried selling this to the people. But in New York City, in the early days, it was a huge scandal. It was called oleo margarine. And they were trying to substitute it for butter. But it was, people didn't regard it as food. Like, this, this isn't food. This is, what is this? And there were riots over this and lawsuits and court battles um, that made sure that people knew that this wasn't real food, that this wasn't butter. Because the whole gimmick of oleo margarine was to make it seem like it was butter in the beginning. And people really resisted. And they did, they resisted again when they tried substituting lard for these seed oils. And it took a long time, but a very extensive marketing campaign by Procter & Gamble which included phony science. Um, Procter and Gamble would later be the primary funder of the American Heart Association. They essentially started the American Heart Association. So the American Heart Association was a very small group until Procter and Gamble gave them, flooded them with money. And then suddenly they began saying that these seed oils and these vegetable oils, which again, marketing is amazing because most people don't recognize cottonseed as a vegetable. I mean, like, when did that happen, right? Like, cottonseed's not a vegetable. But they began transitioning people into the big, the, the, the amazing accomplishment of these companies was to convince people, and it took a while, that these items that were not regular parts of the American food supply were actually better for us 
than the food we've been eating for generations. So out goes lard, out goes tallow. We're convinced that that's now bad for us beginning in the 50s. But in comes Crisco. In comes these other weird atrocities of science. And still, though, still, despite all of this, come 1970, people are still eating lard and meat and 155 pounds a year. But when you see the tilt of the fiat money printer, which was in reality able to weaponize the entire productive labor of not just America, but since the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, the entire world, you see this powerful shift occur through the funding of false nutrition science, direct subsidies, and then government mandated health policies, which the government I mean, government never really talked to people what told people what to eat before. I mean, it's like wolves don't need the government to tell them what to eat. We were a specific species. It wasn't really controversial. People really shouldn't need to buy my book to, to know what to eat. It's, it's instinctual. But we've been confused. And it's intentional. Like you mentioned earlier when we were talking that it's kind of confusing. There's so much noise out there. That's by intent. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned seed oils, and uh, this is something that <laughs> comes up a lot in, in, in Bitcoin. I think even if you did not study anything about food, but you have been on Bitcoin Twitter, you know that seed oils are evil. <laughs> I think that's that's something that comes up so much with, with Bitcoiners. So why are uh, seed oils uh, not good for us? I mean, it's, Robin, it's like the same reason eating aluminum foil is probably not good for us. It's just it's not food. It's, I, there's, there's far better experts who could go into the toxicity and why. It's just, it's really just not food, but they put it in there. It's cheap. It's so easy to make. It's industrial waste. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't had fried food in, well, that's a correction. In Austin, Texas, there's a place that makes French fries out of lard like they used to. They fried in lard. It's delicious. But yeah, it's not, it's just not food. I, I wish I had a, a more elaborate explanation, but yeah, seed oils aren't part of our food supply. They should, shouldn't be. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the BitBox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code ROBIN at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash ROBIN to get your BitBox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Do you know what um, 
which countries you mentioned a, a, an example before which countries are the closest to to the sound money food uh, still is is there some some examples that you can name where like the there there in the world it's the best or is the whole world kind of already on a fiat food standard no there's a growing amount of people who are seeing through the gaslighting campaign and i would say the perfect food is the ribeye steak because it has a lot of fat which is required for humans to thrive but i think you could achieve health through ground beef and cheaper alternatives like eggs and raw milk. And I don't think all plants are going to kill you. I think plants are primarily great as medicine, but historically, you know, historically you see people eating plants at times, um, but not like today. I mean, for instance, in the Northeast in America, you might have berries available for just a few weeks out of the year before bears get to them. But I live in Arizona now in the south in the Southwest where I shouldn't be eating berries now. Like there it's just people eating berries all year round. Um, it's probably not natural. And I, I tend to believe that what is natural is best, both with economics and with food. And I think they're very related. That's interesting when you uh, pick up like berries or bananas or something like that in Austria, you're like, oh, my banana was there. <laughs> I want to make their holidays, but I don't want to buy my banana from there. Uh, <laughs> Because it has a long way away from there. And I think that's something everyone has to agree on. Uh, like if, if you buy things that have been on so long of a way or has been manipulated or, or uh, pesticides for, for so long, that, that cannot be healthy. Even if you washed the fruit before you eat it, uh, that, that does not make a difference. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's just that's just not right uh even with all, all with the the, the plant-based food i mean the, the biggest thing that i hate is like those plant-based uh meat subsidies where it's just like uh, oh really robin like plastic robin food. it's so yeah. terrible man come on absolutely it's like a chemical shitstorm. like it's it's there it's it's ah uh, yeah i mean it's pretty bad but it Look, I've done it too. I, I've been through the whole. You look very healthy, by the way. Um, it's it's a journey, and it's difficult, and it's hard because a lot of these foods they have us on are very addictive, and the more you eat them, the less willpower you have. It, it wears away at your actual willpower as well. So I don't fault people for eating crappy food and being addicted to sugar. Um, it's hard, and unlike heroin, you can't sit down for five minutes without being bombarded for an ad for peanut butter cups and Snickers bars. It's something, you know, it's, it's difficult. So I have a lot of compassion for, I was overweight myself. Um, I ate a lot of really, really bad food. And when I was a teenager, I got cancer. I had osteogenic sarcoma in my leg. Um, so I mean, health has been, And I'm convinced it was because of my dietary choices. I was a product of the 1990s food pyramid, which emphasized eating no meat because they had a false notion that saturated fat found in meat led to heart ailments and to increase these artificial fats, which I think are just complete toxins. And I was overweight and I got very sick. And I, I never forgot that, which is, I think, part of the reason I was always so interested in this field, trying to find out why, why our food system went, went this route. Let's come to, to the solution, um, because I think it's such a systemic problem that we, I, I think just advertising uh, it will, will not help long term. I think we, we definitely need uh, some, some uh, more fundamental solution. And I feel like Bitcoin probably is for me at least, uh, the solution that can fix the thing. Do you also think so that, that Bitcoin, when we have like a sound money standard, that this sound food standard uh, also comes back? And, and why will Bitcoin uh, fix fiat food if it does? It, it does. And well, let me praise it like this. Bitcoin does nothing for food specifically, absolutely nothing. But what it does do is it ends the distortion of current monetary policy. Right now, we're living in this bizarre world where 
because of the fiat money printer, it can guide public opinion. And what Bitcoin would do, or truthfully, any hard currency, it wouldn't have to be Bitcoin. I just think Bitcoin is better than gold. And I outlined the reasons why in my book, gold inevitably gets centralized and confiscated. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pattern that always happens. It's like, we're going to have gold. People have a gold standard. And then everybody puts their gold in banks and gets paper notes. And then the government declares an emergency and says, the economy is tanking because of greedy people. We need to seize all the gold. It happens every time. Um, Bitcoin's better. It's decentralized. If you have your own, if you have your own, um, if you self custody, but what Bitcoin would do every time you buy a little bit of Bitcoin, you take a stab at the Federal Reserve and it would end the incentive. There'd be no incentive for the Federal Reserve to distort our food supply if there's no monetary inflation. People would just be allowed to make their own decisions. And I'm convinced that people left to their own vice are, are generally pretty smart. What we have in America is a, 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 a infinite amount of dollars have flooded the zone to confuse people about what to eat for the past 55 years to create this fad. Like people like to think the carnivore diet's a fad. The carnivore diet more or less is, is the base diet. That's what people have been eating for thousands of years. The fad is the fact that we're eating Crisco for 55 years and plastic foods that come in these insane wrappers full of preservative soy lecithin and all this garbage. Bitcoin would end the incentive for the Federal Reserve to alter the food supply because the reason they're doing it is to hide the consequences of inflation. But without inflation, what would be the purpose? It's not, they're not just doing it because they're evil. They're doing it because they want to maintain power. And I'll give you a quick story that illustrates my point. Um, in the 1960s, we were still on the gold standard. But at that point, we had already printed far more promissory notes than we had gold. So Lyndon Johnson, the president at the time, was going through some inflation because he had printed too many dollars. And he was considering running for re-election. But there was a problem. The price of eggs had gone up too much. So people were very upset about the price of eggs going up. So he called in his surgeon general and he said, look, you need to write a phony press release. Tell people that eggs are bad for you. And he did that. And this is all recorded. This isn't a conspiracy. Um, a biographer named Samuelson documented this, who worked for Lyndon Johnson in the book. So Lyndon Johnson called in, called in, in his Surgeon General, instructed him to write a phony press release saying that eggs made people sick. What happened was the phony press release goes out. The, the, the demand for eggs went down because people believed it. The supply stayed the same. So the price went down. They manipulated the situation for political gain because they understood that the eggs going up in price was something that housewives were really upset about. And to this day, people still believe that phony press release, even though it's been exposed again and again, is nonsense. They believe that that press release, the eggs are bad for you. Um, and it's just absolutely amazing the length that people will go to maintain power. Because it's not as though they, it's, they, they they're, again, it's not that they're trying to hurt us, but what they do is they see us, the American public, as a means to an end. And the end is always their empowerment at the detriment of our self-autonomy and our physical health. It's, it's so interesting for me, because I think right now, um, if you observe it, there is a, a stronger, stronger community about people that want to know about food and really care about what they eat. And, but there's also like this, this strong and stronger movement where like the, this feared food wave <laughs> comes in and it, it, it kind of becomes more popular. Are you um, um, positive that like in maybe 20 years or 30 years, we, we are on more of a um, sound food system or will, will this Will it get worse before it gets better? Or do you have some, some time framework to, to, you to think about it, that? Unfortunately, Robin, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, the current... So to just go back a little bit, there's red meat and beef is difficult 
to, it's difficult to process a cow. Ask any farmer, like you farmers in your family. It's it's cost intensive. It's it's a lot of labor, and for decades, there's been reasons why we shouldn't eat red meat. Um, in the 1940s, the government told the American people not to eat red meat because we needed to save it for the soldiers fighting abroad to keep them strong and that we should plant victory gardens. And then in the 70s, we shouldn't eat red meat because red meat was too labor intensive. And because of overpopulation, we are all going to starve. So we all need to eat plants. And then in the 80s, they told us that red meat, saturated fat found in red meat, rose cholesterol, which caused heart attacks. And then in the late 90s and early 2000s, we're not supposed to eat red meat because it changes the temperature of the earth. So you eating your red meat changes the temperature of the earth. Um, I mean, and, and attributing, like, this is nothing new. I mean, you could go back to the 1500s when they used to blame eccentric women for uh, who they would call witches for crops not coming up and they would burn them and appease the gods. Like we've, we really haven't changed that much, but right now with global warming as the most recent reason why we can't, or climate change, they, they shifted it from global warming to climate change. Um, in New York city, for instance, they're talking about eliminating meat entirely from the public school system. So right now there's meatless Mondays in public school, but they're talking about increasing that to Wednesdays and Fridays. And the momentum seems to be on the other side. And the reason I really fear it's going to get worse before it gets better is because inflation is going to get worse. So remember, inflation takes a while to really be felt. The inflation that happened when both Trump and then Biden flooded America with more dollars during COVID is still being felt. It's like it's like a big pillow fight where all these feathers go everywhere. It takes time for the, the feathers to settle. So as inflation gets worse and meat becomes increasingly cost prohibitive, you're going to see the gaslighting campaign to convince us more and more why we should be eating cheaper foods like grains. And I think that's going to something that grows until inflation well, there, the inflation's there's no stopping it um, in the near future. So I don't know. I, I wish I had something. Robin, I want to be positive, man. I want to have something positive to say, but I, I can't imagine a situation where absent of ending the Federal Reserve, the monetary gaslighting campaign reverts. I just don't see it. I mean, there have been guests on that uh, said that in, in the next five to ten years the Federal Reserve will end. Uh, I don't, I don't see it personally because I think the 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 power and the network effects they have is just way too strong uh, to happen that quick. Uh, but yeah, maybe maybe we will be surprised by by the fast adoption of Bitcoin and the, the fast decrease of the power of the the central banks. Who knows? I would wish for it. Uh, I don't I don't see it right now. I mean, we can even see it in, 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 in Turkey, for example, have a major inflation rate. They still use the Turkish lira. They did not switch to US dollars. They did not switch to Bitcoin, but they still use that broken money. Like that's so obvious. Uh, but it's also obvious in the US dollars and for the euros, but not that obvious as in the Turkey. So I don't know how, how, how long we can go, but it seems that uh, people believe that it's money and, and they, they don't ride on, on the streets uh, for it. The, they do it for other things, but not, not for money. It, it feels like, or, or they blame other things for it. They blame uh, rich people or big corporations on them and not the, the system itself, uh, which, which is interesting for me. Well, I mean, I think you're totally right. And I would put blame on academia in America. We've, if you go, I love economics. I would never have gone to any college in America to study economics. It's all taught by Keynesian professors who are morons. I mean, they're just dumb. Like, I don't know, you ever try to, for this book, I had to go through a lot of their theories. Uh, for instance, the Keynesian multiplier effect Try explaining that to a nine-year-old running a lemonade stand. It, it makes no sense that if you give the government more money, it multiplies. But if you keep it yourself individually, it stagnates. 
the purpose of Keynesian professors and who dominate academia and justify money printing is, is literally just to play the role of court jester for the money printer. And to once again, kind of like they did with health during COVID, to have us outsource our understanding because they have all these PhDs. And what you have is because they're saying things that don't make sense, a lot of really smart people just think, gosh, I just must not be smart enough to understand it. No, you are. It's a con. They've been running this con for a while. But I think to your point, to be a little optimistic, I think more and more people are beginning to catch on that maybe Paul Krugman is actually the moron. And it's not me because he's been wrong every time he talks and makes a prediction. And that that kind of thing matters. I mean, we there in America, the memory hole hasn't gone into effect to the extent yet that they can't hide their past comments. So we know when the president, Joe Biden, would say, oh, inflation is going down. It's continuing to go down. Prices are never going down until the Federal Reserve either completely transforms or ends. But it's a matter of how quickly they go up, not whether they go up. And nobody's ever talking about returning to 2020 prices. That's done. This is the new norm. And I think there is a lot of interest. I mean, maybe even my podcast is an attest to that because I'm completely new in Bitcoin podcasting. I started half a year ago uh, and, and now have like around 40,000 weekly listeners and, and watchers of a wow. Bitcoin podcast that is just half a year old. And that's just YouTube. That's not including Spotify or X or something like that because it's harder to track there. Um, but it's, Man, it's, I, I uh, probably should have combed my hair. I had no idea you had so many viewers. <laughs> no, no, no. Like uh, I, I publish uh, daily. So there's like seven episodes and around those episodes, uh, YouTube. Tells Congratulations. Me have... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's just an attest to, um, people are hungry for those types of contents. Like the, people are hungry for, for finding out what was actually going on. I think that's, that's the major takeaway for me. Like, uh, I, if there would not, would not be a, a big demand for that, uh, there would not be like five, six uh, Bitcoin podcasts that are all really uh, Bitcoin only podcasts that are all growing really, really quickly and they're all doing basically the same thing. So like there's a, a lot of demand on, on on that. And I see like people coming into the, uh, they're seeing the show and all of a sudden they're like uh, two, three days just watching like 20 episodes of mine. So like the demand is uh, is amazing. And, uh, and that's that gives me hope, honestly, the, the replies that I get. I mean, I'm also living in a kind of a bubble that's <laughs> because of that, but uh, it, it gives me also hope for, for, for the future. Um, yeah. yeah, Robin, I think one of the, COVID was awful, obviously, but one of the bright spots was that it led a lot of people that I know personally, including myself. I grew up as somebody who trusted American institutions. I, I didn't think they always did the right thing, but I never doubted their motives. I, I, I thought these institutions in America were good. They're, they're, they're built like people like me. And we're the country that put the man on the moon, I think. And COVID, like it happened to me, it jumped the shark, as they say. It, it just, they clearly lied about a lot of it. I think COVID was real. The virus was real. But there was also a lot of lies about it. and. Um, you know, over and over again, we were told that, uh, you know, you get the vaccine, for instance, and you once you get the vaccine, you can't spread it and you can't get it. And this was said over and over again. And I, I, I think one of the blessings is people are now thinking, wow, I think I think they lied to me. And I'm, they begin to look at everything differently now, including myself. I'm just I'm, I was shocked. I believed everything they said in the beginning. Luckily, I didn't, I didn't get any shots, but I, I believed them. And I was like, oh, I'll let some other people get the shot first to see how this goes. And um, I think that lack of trust has a parallel in people embracing their own self-autonomy and making decisions on their own. Like we don't, I'm not a medical expert. I'm not a doctor, but I can smell a con. I've been an investigative reporter for 20 years. I've interviewed congressmen and presidents. I, I, I know when somebody's lying to me. I have four daughters. I'm trained in understanding lies. And this idea of like 
not just trying to reflect back on COVID, but like, wow, they're lying to us about our food. That's insane. What? Like that, I can't look at anything the same anymore, Robin. Like nothing in my life since writing Fiat Food is the same. Nothing. Because I never in a million years would have thought that they would lie to us about our food supply. But they did. And they did knowingly. They, the, the truth is out there and they know it. They know that Fruit Loops are not healthier than eggs. They know that. Yet they're telling us that. And they've gone too far. And a lot of people in the Bitcoin community are very skeptically minded. Your audience is the kind of audience, I think, that is reevaluating a lot of the premises that they've assumed these axioms that we've accepted. I am too. So I'm, I'm kind of proud to be part of the movement, but I also feel new, like there's so much more I need to learn. Um, my next book I'm working on is about fiat medicine. And you want to hear about something dark. I and mean, it's very related to the food, which is why it was the next jumping off point, but it's it's dark. I'm, I'm very proud in taking no medicin medica medications for, I cannot say this word, uh, as for, for like, I think one and a half or two years now. And like, I try to avoid it as, as much as possible. So like, I'm really looking forward to fiat medicine, what, what you write, uh, could be really interesting. Um, coming now closer to the end, because we have an end routine also, and we're already close to that one hour mark. Um, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? I think one of the big things I want your audience to understand is they, I hope they buy my book, Fiat Food. They don't have to. Um, they don't need to buy any diet books. People know what to eat. Go back and look at what your great-great-grandmother ate. She was probably right. You know, the organs and a lot of natural foods. Trust yourself. Um, you don't. You don't need to go to experts and and understand that what we've been told about health, what we've been told about what to eat, it isn't science. It's marketing, and you are your audience should be empowered to make their own decisions. And generally, it really isn't too hard to figure out what's right. I mean, stay. You know, Crisco is. Margarine, I mean, stuff's not even food. Seed oils. If they can take the oil they're making my french fries with and fuel a car with it, probably shouldn't be eating it. It's, it's probably, probably a sign that something's gone wrong. So I just hope your audience really kind of trusts themselves and reevaluates their former belief if they had it in these credentialed experts because they have lied to us. I, I love that line. You should not eat the same food as your car. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> that, that seems very logical. <laughs> Perfect. Then let's come to the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest uh, without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and your question from the previous guest is, what is unique about your voice, about your personality? Um, that's a great question. What is unique about my voice? I don't... I think... I think one thing that strikes me about myself and my wife tells me is that um, I'm 46 years old. I don't need a lot of stuff. You'll probably, any interview you see me and I'm probably wearing the same shirt. I have it in a little closet there. I just stick it on right before an interview. So I, I really don't, I feel very free. I don't really care about, um, I'm at a point in my life at 46 with four daughters and I've made my money. I feel I don't need a lot of stuff where I just don't care about what other people think. If I feel like something's important to say, I, I feel very comfortable in saying it regardless of the backlash and the canceling effects and, and all these different things. So I, I, I would like to say in answer to that question that I feel free. Thank you so much, Matthew, uh, for coming on the show and for taking the time today. I also thank you so much for everyone watching and listening uh, today to us. Uh, as always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks, man. <laughs>